Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art, and I'm taking a break from work and I thought I'd read a little bit from this book, uh, Poison Power by Drs. John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin. I uh, apologize for not putting up a video last night. I ended up falling asleep right after I was on the live stream with Dana. Uh, that's Beautiful Girl by Dana. It's a live stream. If anybody doesn't know about it, it's an awesome place to go to connect and get real information. That's basically been forgotten and buried. Dana does a lot of work reminding us of actually what the cat catastrophe is about, not just the current hidden news. Um, and also, anybody listening to this, we'd really appreciate your support on our GoFundMe page. I'll have a link below. If you would help us contribute to uh, purchasing Radcast, a gamma spectrometer, we want to set up a people's lab here in the Northwest so that we can start testing our food for radiation and for the various kinds of radiation. You know, the government only tests for a very limited amount of radiation, so we want to test for the right ones, uh, lots of them. <laughs> and so uh, if that would help quite a bit. And then finally, I do want to remind people to go onto the NRC website, look for uh, open for public comment. There's a little drop down menu that talks about public engagement and you want to say open for public comment and look for the uh, no threshold versus hormesis theory and put your opinion in that we think that the NRC ought to be um, measuring for radiation and that the hormesis theory is unproven and unsafe and unhealthy that in fact radiation is completely intolerable and quite harmful to all life on this planet as we're learning in this book by Poison Power. So I'm going to take my glasses off so I can read better. We're on Chapter 3, uh, How Radiation Produces Disease and Hereditary Alterations, page 69, third paragraph down. Many authorities suspect that some particular type of chromosome injury as yet unidentified is essential if the cell is to go through the sequence of changes that finally convert it into a full-blown cancer cell. Certainly, identification of the precise nature of such a chromosomal change represents one of contemporary biology's major challenges. Whatever chromosome alteration may prove to be, we know that it does occur all too often when human cells are exposed to ionizing radiation. When ionizing radiation interacts with one of the chromosomes, there are two major ways in which the information system of the cell can be permanently altered by radiation. Genes are the units of information within the chromosome. They are composed largely of a chemical popularly known as DNA. I'm going to attempt to write, read this word. Dioxoribo dioxoribonucleic acid. Um, radiation can produce a chemical alteration in a part of a single gene so that the gene functions abnormally thereafter, providing the cell with false directions. When such cells divide, the altered gene may be reproduced in the descendant cells. If a single cell of a chromosome has been chemically altered, so that it provides new directions, a point mutation is said to have occurred. Radiation can also produce a different type of change in the form of information cell of information system of the cell. Let me read that again. Radiation can also produce a different type of change in the information system of the cell. This change occurs if the chromosome is physically broken. On page 72 is shown a schematic diagram of the human chromosome. That's page 72. It has two arms and a small region between known as the centromere. And I think this means page 71 because this is page 71 and it's talking about the centromere. So it says here, it has two arms in a small region known as the centromere. See these two arms? Look at that. So I think that's a typo. I'm talking about this. I'll read that page in a second. 
When a cell divides, a centromere leads the way for the chromosome to go to the daughter cell. When radiation breaks off a piece from one of the arms of the chromosome, this piece, is, this piece no longer has a centromere. As a result, it gets lost from the cell on the very next cell division. A single chromosome has hundreds or thousands of genes within it. Thus, the piece of a chromosome broken off may have tens or even hundreds of genes in it. Such genes are lost to the daughter cells when their chromosome piece is lost. For a short period of time measured in hours, a broken piece of chromosome may rejoin its chromosome. Our concern, of course, is with the loss of those pieces which do not rejoin their own or some other chromosome in the cell. Presumably, it has too many different, it has too many crucial genes I'm sorry, presumably, if too many crucial genes are lost, thereby the cell may die. Oh, I see what he's talking about on this page. Actual photograph of human chromosomes in a cell that had received gamma ray treatment. Some are intact, others show breaks indicated by the arrows produced by radiation. The pieces which are broken off will be lost when the cell divides. Number the number of chromosome breaks depending on the radiation dose. So oh check that out. You can see the arrows how it's breaking. That's what radiation does to our cells. It breaks the chromosomes. Wow. No wonder we have mutations. So let me go back to this page and I'll explain this one to you. This says, systematically, the human chromosome can be described as following. Each chromosome consists of a centromere and two arms. One arm may be lo much longer than the other arm in certain, in certain of human chromosomes. The middle picture says, when a cell is preparing for division, the entire chromosome duplicates itself, and the two duplicate, duplicates are seen side by side. And then here... And then when it's about to reproduce itself, it it's and it's repairs side by side. And then here we go here. As the cell completes a division, one member of the pair goes to a daughter cell. The other member goes to the other daughter cell. Any chromosome piece broken off by radiation and hence no longer attached to the centromere is lost to the daughter cell. Oh, you see what happens? Okay, so these go to the daughter cell right here. So if this breaks off, all of this whole piece is lost to the daughter cell and it doesn't reproduce. So when these things break off, like say here, and this goes to a daughter cell, it will not, it will not go back on. Wow. So it's, it loses all those genes and all that information. With lesser losses, the information alteration is not so grave as to cause the cell's death, but the loss of genes might, be, might so imbalance the cellular information in the cell as to cause its ultimate development into a cancer cell. Loss of a piece of a chromosome and the genes within it is called a mutation. The loss, of its appropriately, the loss is appropriately designated as a deletion. For we have truly thereby deleted a piece of a chromosome and its genes. So radiation can provoke both major types of mutations, point mutations, and deletions. If the mutation occurs in a body cell, meaning the cell other than a reproductive cell, the potential result ultimately is cancer. The kind of chromosome alteration or mutation required is not known. I bet you they know now. However, leading opinion holds that a single radiation event is sufficient to provoke the chromosomal change required in a cell to start it on the path toward being a cancer cell. It is very easy to understand from this that as the radiation dose goes up, the risk of future cancer development goes up in direct proportion. This is true because of the chance of the, quote, right kind of a single damaging event will go, will occur, goes up in direct proportion to the amount of radiation. I'll read that again. 
This is true because the chance of the right kind of a single damaging event will occur goes up in the direct proportion to the amount of radiation. New evidence, both for experimental animals and humans, makes it quite certain that the incidence of cancer after irradiation goes up in direct proportion to the total amount of radiation received. The particular kind of cancer that occurs depends on which organ was had received radiation, irradiation. Thyroid gland irradiation leads ultimately to thyroid cancer. Mammary gland irradiation leads to breast cancer. Bone marrow irradiation leads to various forms of leukemia. In each case, the numbers of cancers appearing are expected to go up in direct proportion to the amount of radiation received by the particular organ of the body. Adult nerve cells represent a singular exception. They do not divide, hence cannot become cancerous. Brain cancer induced by radiation or occurring spontaneously is really cancer of special connective tissue cells interspersed among the nerve cells. That's interesting. New subtitle, Hereditary Alterations. Let us turn now to the effects of radiation-induced mutations in two important remaining cell types, the germinal cells of the testes, source of spermatozoa, the male reproductive cells, and the germinal cells of the ovary, source of ova, the female reproductive cells. Radiation injury of these classes of cells has even more far-reaching consequences than radiation injury, which leads to other types of cells, to leukemia or cancer. Changes in the chromosomes of immature sperm or ova cells can be transmitted to all future generations of humans. Wow, let me read that again. Changes in the chromosomes of immature sperm or ova cells may be transmitted to all future generations of humans. The heredity of man, our greatest treasure, is at stake. Once injured, the chromosomes cannot be repaired by any process known to man, except in the short space of time described above. Wow. The cells which produce sperm are called sperma spermatogonia. Those which produce ova are called oocytes. Mature spermatozoa have 23 chromosomes. Mature ova have 23 chromosomes. Upon fertilization, ovum by sperm, we return the number to 46 chromosomes, which characterizes all cells from the fertilized ovum through the entire adult human. Injury to the sperm or ova chromosomes while, while in the testes or the ovary, either by point mutation or chromosome deletions, can thus be carried forward into every cell of a new human being. Worse yet, since every cell of the new human can carry such a mutation, the sperm or ova of this human can carry them also, so that the original injury persists through successive generations. <clears throat> we are probably fortunate that some of the mutations have such deler deleterious effects that the sperm or ova bearing the mutation fail to lead to a fertilized ovum or if this does occur, the unborn baby is miscarried. But all too many serious mutations do permit the development of humans whose cells bear the mutation and who suffer serious health consequences as a result. How serious are the health effects <clears throat> upon new generations of humans carrying mutated genes or altered chromosomes? We are only beginning to realize that it may be possible to tolerate only a very small number of additional mutations of genes or chromosomes as a result of technological poisons if humans are to continue to produce new generations of humans. Wow, so maybe this is intentional. They want us to, like, be sterile. Countless geneticists 
have repeatedly cautioned society about the danger of allowing any increase in the rate at which any type of mutations are introduced into the general population. They know very well that mutations do occur due to natural sources of radiation and other causes, many of which are not understood to this date. Some who attempt to make light of the hazards of introducing unnecessary mutations are quick to point out that some mutations are beneficial, and indeed they may be. But prevailing genetic opinion indicates that we cannot hope to improve man by increasing his mutation rate. We can, however, count upon doing a great deal of harm, measured in untold human suffering from physical and mental deformities, and a higher incidence of many serious diseases if we allow mutation rates to increase. <clears throat> the Nobel Laureate in Genetics, Professor Joshua Lederberg, Dr. Joshua Lederberg, Professor of Genetics, Stanford University, Palo Alto, California, Affidavit, September 8, 1970, Docket 3445, before the Public Service Board of Vermont, recently indicated his grave concern about the implications of increasing the existing mutation rate of our genes and stated that present radiation standards allow for a 10% increase in mutation rate. Oh my God, so what have they freaking done to us? <clears throat> I mean, they increased the radiation rate after Fukushima like a thousandfold. Like, what the fuck? And he says, I believe that the present standards for population exposure to radiation should and will at least de facto be made more stringent to about 1% of the spontaneous rate and that this is also a reasonable standard for the maximum tolerable tolerable mutagenic or hereditary effect of any environmental chemical. Dr. Lederberg is suggesting that all forms of influence in our environment which can provoke genetic mutation or chromosome injury be 1% of spontaneous rate. Yet he suggests that the serious situation that we are currently legally permitting 10% of the spontaneous rate from radiation alone. Let us quote Professor Lederberg on this. <clears throat> and I quote, A 10% increase in the, existing, in the existing spontaneous mutation rate is in effect the standard that has been adopted as the maximum acceptable level of public exposure to radiation by responsible regulatory bodies. Unquote. One wonders how it can be that responsible. I'm sorry, I'm going to start again. One wonders how it can be that responsible regulatory bodies would allow 10 times more genetic injury to the population from radiation alone when a highly respected geneticist suggests that 1% as a maximum for radiation plus chemicals combined. Other geneticists concur. A multitude of unsatisfactory answers to this question has been provided. One is that we cannot afford to impede technological process by undue restrictions. Boy, we're hearing that in the Congress right now by the uh, traitors, the Republicans. Thus, atomic energy programs such as nuclear electricity generation must be beneficial to humans in terms of convenience and comfort. So they must be allowed to pollute the environment with radioactive substances that will ultimately produce genetic changes in man. A reasonable question? Why must radiation be released at such high level for the atomic energy programs to proceed? This question has n is never asked, but the answer is, of course, economics. It is cheaper to pollute than to take the necessary steps to prevent pollution. Promoters of all technology realize the intuitive promoters of all technology realize this intuitively and consciously. Wow. It is cheaper to pollute than to take the necessary steps to prevent pollution. 
because it's cheaper. That's why. Hence, they press for the loosest possible standards of pollution, or better yet, no restrictions at all. Wow, we're at 20 minutes. I'm going to stop here, you guys. My cat wants out. He just jumped up on the table. So um, I'll talk to you guys again soon. Put your courage feet on. Please take some action, whatever you think is right. Please make your comments at the NRC. Ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on. Bye.